Thank you for tuning in. Our next presenter is Neil Chakravarti, President of WOW Unlimited Media. Mr. Chakravarti, you may begin. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for making the time to uh, visit the WOW presentation. Uh, I will dive right in with uh, the disclaimer slide and start off with a short video of the company's main business, which is animation. to build it wow is a global animation focused entertainment company and to do that we're doing it with two specific verticals the first vertical is content where we have two simple revenue models one is a service model where we make great service shows for partners across the world and then the second is original animation IP where we build shows and we license it out to partners across the world and as you can see the goal in the service business is to be the best service partner while in the IP business is to build hits and long-term value for the company. The other side of our business is the media business, where the largest part is a large YouTube network, where the revenue is primarily advertising, as you know well. And what are we trying to do on YouTube? We're trying to discover great talent and build audiences for our show. Now, the business was founded in 2016 and was called Wow Unlimited. That was on the back of a premise of unlimited shelf space for high quality content. But what do we mean by that? Unlike television back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when we grew up and we had shows across different half an hour slots and one hour slots, there's virtually unlimited slots now to place programming because of these global streamers, many of which keep appearing as the years go by. And as you can tell, the demand of content from, from, these, from these companies is massive because their demand is not just limited to the traditional TV demand, but also they're looking at building large libraries of content 
which are driven by balance sheets that are far larger than traditional media companies. So while 20, 30, 40 billion dollar media companies would, would, would make three, four, five billion dollars of content historically, content is now bought by trillion dollar companies like Apple and Amazon and very large mega cap media companies like Netflix and Disney. And for the foreseeable future, we see tremendous demand for quality content from these large streamers. Now let's talk about the service side of our business. The goal, as we said, is to be the trusted partner, the best and fast partner for clients worldwide. Both of our studios, Mainframe and Frederator, have a long track record working out of Vancouver and Los Angeles, respectively. And now we have the benefit of a global studio pipeline, which is a virtually hosted in the cloud software, which actually received a significant boost during the COVID crisis when we were able to move almost 700 people to work virtually in the cloud. And we hope that this global studio pipeline will provide tremendous operating leverage to the company's scalable, scalability in the quarters and the years ahead. Speaking of services, this is the latest show we did. It's Madagascar Little Wild for our partners DreamWorks and that debuted on Hulu and Peacock simultaneously. Now let's talk about IP. This is where we make shows and we license shows. And the biggest show we've done in our short history is Castlevania. It was produced for Netflix, and now we're producing season four of Castlevania. There's a video game we adapted to series and has been called by some sites as the best video game adaptation ever. Some of our other popular shows include Bee and Puppycat, which became a very popular hit on YouTube originally, and then was recently picked up by Netflix. Some other shows include Bravest Warriors and Reboot, which won, category, which won awards in various categories. Now, when you look at the IP business, this business is also growing with new properties coming up. And our newest property in development is a property called Catbug. As you can tell, the merchandise for Catbug is already available on the back of its popularity on some of the social platforms. As a matter of fact, on TikTok, if you were to do a hashtag Catbug, you're probably going to come across more than 200 million views of Catbug content. And then even on Giphy, there's well over 200 million loops of Catbug content. So this is a promising property. Uh, it's exciting. There's a lot of noise in the social domain. We'll see how it develops over time. The other parts of the business that come out of IP are licensing and merchandising. And this gives you a look into some of the licensing and the merchandising that the company has been doing and is sort of building over time, and you expect to see more of this coming out in the quarters ahead. In addition to licensing and merchandising, the other expansion from IP is publishing. And we've got a federated books division uh, that sold quite a few books in 2019 and is looking forward to more growth in 2020. Uh, sorry, 2020, and is looking forward to more growth in 2021. So when you look at the YouTube business, the question is with animation, how does YouTube help us? This is how it helps us. Number one, YouTube has a billion views over each month across all of our channels. And we have over 3,000 channels. And we drove over 30 million of revenue in the last 12 months on YouTube. Now, what do these numbers mean? How do they help us? This is how they help us. Number one, they help us discover talent and IP. We're always looking for great animation, video gaming talent. Number two, we can take some of that talent and we can make shows or short, short shows within our captive studios at very low or no cost. And third, the final leverage of the YouTube business is that we can actually take those shows and test it against a real audience and get a lot of data in terms of what they like, what they don't like, and a lot of commentary around the shows that we make. So that's a critical role the YouTube business plays in the WoW system. So when you put the story together, what does it look like even though we're a small company? Oh, I think I missed a slide. I'll quickly do that slide before. There we go. So there's an integrated WOW ecosystem I'd like to just spend a minute on. As you saw, we have a discovery engine in YouTube where with the billions of views and thousands of channels, we're always looking for IP and also generating ad revenue and running an EBITDA positive business. When it comes to development of content, not only do we have the traditional development process, 
we also have done programs like the Federator Shorts, which are short shows that we do with partners such as Sony and Nickelodeon, and we test it against an audience. Then we have our own in-house studios to produce that IP. And finally, when it comes to monetization and distribution of that IP, we are doing service work as well as IP licensing, as I showed you earlier. Spend a minute on the WOW team. Our CEO and chairman, Michael Hirsch, is one of the founders of the Canadian animation industry. Michael has built great animation companies starting with Nirvana in 1971, which he sold in 2000, and then built Cookie Jar, which he sold to DHX Media and was on the board of DHX Media. Uh, just my background quickly, accounting, investment banking, working as a media exec and now as a media entrepreneur exec. John Vanderbilt, our CFO, brings great strength from a traditional financial reporting audit side as well as key production financing. Michael Heffron, the, the president of our mainframe studios, has been in the business for about four decades, worked and built studios not just in Canada and the U.S., but in Germany, but in Australia as well. And he's been running mainframe since 2012. And Kim Dent Wilder is the head of all production and operations at mainframe. She's been at that role for 20 years understands the team, understands the client and the production process very, very well. Let's talk a bit about the numbers. Uh, our revenue has been growing well over the last three to four years. As you can see, there's a split here between the animation and the media side. Uh, the more important part about our business that is happening now is that we've gone EBITDA positive. And this was something that the market was expecting. And as you can see, in the last 12 months, we did about 75 million of top line and 3 million of EBITDA. The big difference in the media business, some new investors uh, probably will have this question, is, is that you know, we exited uh, a, low, a low profit non-core partnership that we had in YouTube, uh, which really was taking a lot of our bandwidth, but wasn't really generating money. And as you can see, it has not had any negative effect on our financials. Uh, the most important metric in our business, however, is our production backlog. So as you can see on this slide, as of December 23rd, our backlog was about $95 million. This $95 million compares to $42 million of last 12 months animation sales. And it, while it excludes the billings in progress for uh, Q4, it's a significant jump, as you can see, and, and I'm happy to report that most of this jump, almost all of this jump, is from new clients, new relationships, new projects, which is as a result of uh, the additional amount of exciting discussions we're having with clients uh, during COVID. Just quickly on the capitalization and the shareholding, uh, we haven't raised any equity in the last almost a couple of years, so we have 32 million shares. Uh, and and uh, in the net debt, of course, we've included the leases, which is pursuant to FR16, and we've given you a view of the cap table with and without leases. We recently refinanced our convertible bond. We had a uh, $4.3 million convertible from 2017 that expired in 2020 and uh, in December, and we successfully refinanced it in December 2020. I know I'm a little behind time, so I'm just going to rush through this last slide so I can take some questions from the audience. Uh, let's talk about the summary and the investment highlights. So number one, as you saw, there is a tremendous demand for content right now, uh, and especially when it comes to quality content. So it's a large, large market. Number two, you saw the rate at which the business is growing and, and hopefully great visibility in revenues for the next couple of years when you look at the animation backlog, which is, uh, as far as orders are concerned, at 94 million, 95 million as of the end of last year. We've given you a glimpse of the partners we're working with. We're pretty much working with most, if not all, large OTT platforms, streaming platforms, global players, and YouTube. We've given you a view of the management. It's a management that has been in the animation business uh, for 50 years and more in some cases, and with a very strong track record. And finally, the company is, is now on the EBITDA positive trajectory and we see significant opportunity for value creation 
from IP exploitation. Historically, we've done more service work than IP work. And as you all know, IP is where the hits are. So we expect to sort of work hard, develop shows like Catbug and more. We've got an exciting development slate. We're talking to many partners and hopefully find uh, many hits in the quarters and years ahead. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and also apologize for the minor technical glitch we had. Uh, I, I just was thrown off the platform and went mute for a while. Uh, but thank you once again. I'm just going to quickly look at the question list. And uh, uh, operator, at this point, we are prepared to take questions. If, uh, if that's something you will be initiating or uh, we're ready. Please go ahead. You'll uh, drive your own questions. Okay. So. So do we just do we just say so we just ask the person or okay I'll just read the questions okay fair enough the first question uh, is at what point it's from Bobby Craft SNN at what point after you've tested a show on YouTube is it then ready uh, for the next step that's a great question uh, once you once you put a show on YouTube you want to monitor the kind of viewership you have around it you've got a lot of uh, quantitative data you've got a lot of qualitative data. Uh, it could sometimes be, uh, if, if, if it's a phenom uh, that, that is getting a lot of notoriety, it could be a much quicker discussion. And in some cases, it would be discussions we would take to the streamers. Well, I can't point to how long each discussion takes on an average. Sometimes it could be in weeks if the property really becomes popular, and sometimes it could be months. I'll uh, move to the next question. Uh, 34% insider, 40% institutional, 12% Bell Canada, 14% retail. How much and which of those shares are in the float and tradable? Uh, I'll try to answer the, be answer the question to the best of my ability. It's, it's from Richard Henke. Uh, the insider and Bell shares are obviously uh, not tradable. Uh, insiders haven't sold uh, since uh, inception. Neither has Bell sold since uh, Bell came on board. They have been reinvesting. Uh, I would I would argue that technically the institutional and the retail is sort of the technical float, but uh, but uh, we have noticed that the institutional investors who invest in the company are more long term in nature, and and uh, you know they they have uh, supported and stood by the company as we are turning the story around and driving. Uh, towards future growth. We haven't seen much activity from the long-term institutionals, so I would say the the main flow is within sort of the retail community, the retail percentage here. Your business is, the next question, sorry, from Sean Maloney, is your business is trading at a light valuation relative to peers. What is the plan to unlock value for shareholders? That's a great question. Sean, I think uh, I'll go back to uh, the presentation and refer a couple of things. Number one, in some ways, the market has been expecting and, and the shareholders who follow us have been expecting us to start, you know, uh, getting into a profitable territory and start producing results uh, that are EBITDA positive. As you saw, we have we have crossed that chasm in, in 2019 uh, and, and obviously we're looking at 3 million EBITDA on an LTM basis. And, and uh, the analysts uh, have uh, positive EBITDA projections and growth for the, for the years ahead. Uh, I think at this point, the company is starting to show uh, the momentum of that growth. That's number one. Number two, uh, we are giving you uh, strong visibility into the revenue that's booked for the next uh, year or two years. Uh, via the backlog, that should give you a good sense of of, uh, of where value creation is coming. Uh, finally, uh, at the end of the day, pro the, the profitability metrics are starting to go up as well. And, and we're hoping that when we are compared uh, to the peer group in, in 2021, uh, investors will see that, uh, that you know, it really is trading at a light valuation, but at the same time, it's a company that has turned the corner, has a lot going on, for it, for a micro cap, or dare I say, nano cap company, has a vertically integrated ecosystem, has a very large reach, audience base, uh, direct consumer, which is very unique in our business, and and hopefully that should get more investors excited about the story, and I think more 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 demand will will hopefully reflect in the capital markets as well. 
the other question from you, Sean, is what is your 40 with the guidance? Uh, we're not giving guidance at this point, uh, and, and the best reflection we can give you is, is obviously the LTM numbers, and, uh, and, and you have visibility into the revenue pipeline or, or the animation backlog that you've already. Uh, so I think that's all the questions. I'm sorry, there's one more. Uh, Jeremy Diller, private, can you talk about revenue profit? When do you expect to be cash flow positive? How much debt do you have? Uh, I'll tackle it in reverse order. Uh, I think on the debt, we showed about 7 million gross debt, which is about 4.7 million if we convert, and 2.3 million of a line of credit. Uh, there's 4.5 million cash sitting against it. So purely from a debt and cash standpoint, that's two and a half million net debt. In addition, we have about 15 odd million of leases, which obviously we add to the net debt calculation now uh, because of IFRS 16 guidelines. So, so that's the debt picture. Uh, the company is, is EBITDA positive on an LTM basis. And uh, you know, we don't have a tremendous amount of uh, interest expense uh, or, or capital expenditures, so that should give you a sense of where the cash flow uh, numbers are on a levered basis. Uh, in addition, we have very, very significant tax loss carry forwards of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in excess of 55 million uh, from the past years, which, which we hopefully, uh, which hopefully should help us uh, in, in, the, in the quarters and years ahead. Uh, Sean, I'm finding another question from you, which is merger opportunities. Uh, you know, like every uh, public company, we're always looking at interesting opportunities, both within animation and adjacencies, uh, and and we will continue to do so. Uh, question from Sam Namiri. Sam, good to see you here. How long does it take for the backlog to typically flow through the income statement cash flows? Uh, according to our MDNA, the backlog typically represents orders that have performance in the next 24 to 30 months. So a simple way of looking at that, Sam, would be that this 95 million uh, represents some, not all the sales for the next 24 to 30 months. And as you can imagine, we are always in discussions with uh, prospective clients for newer projects. So it's, it's very likely that we could be in discussion right now for a project that let's say comes, gets contracted in March and begins in April or May and is outside the backlog. And that would be the case for projects, not just for the rest of 20, 2021, but obviously, obviously many discussions happening through 2022 as well. And as you can see, our, our efforts now are not just to look for service uh, projects, but also to look for IT uh, type projects, which obviously allows us to create those hits or start building the hits, which then lend themselves to the additional merchandising, licensing, uh, publishing, and other revenues. I think we'll the last question. Um, Adam Sharma, what percentage of the YouTube audience accesses your content by YouTube Kids versus original YouTube? Uh, well, our YouTube audience is less kids, more grown up. And that's why uh, we did not get hit as badly by the so called kid apocalypse uh, that happened where a lot of the kids' channels were demonetized uh, in YouTube. We have a lot of channels around video gaming, uh, uh, animation around for grown ups. Uh, and and they've gotten less affected. So I would say, if if I understood your question correctly, I would say kids viewership is 20% or less of our overall YouTube viewership. I believe I have addressed all the questions at this point, and I'm three minutes over time. So once again, thank you very much uh, for attending. Thank you for your questions. Hopefully, this addressed uh, uh, some of your questions and concerns around Wow. Uh, I'm very happy to be available for follow-up one-on-one conversations or any discussions. Uh, my email address is neil, N-E-I-L, at wowunlimited.co, and our website is www.wowunlimited.co. Thank you once again, and, and have a great rest of the conference. And that concludes this webcast. Thank you.